Uh, good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone, or good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Moshmi Beltangedi. I'm a senior policy advisor for Tri Hi, I'm a senior policy advisor for Tribal Early Childhood at the Administration for Children and Families. It's so wonderful to be with you all today. Um, we're just really gratified by the interest in this webinar and in this topic, and very excited for um, this webinar today, which is keeping, kicking off a series of meetings on tribal early childhood. Um, as we said in the previous slide, if you're interested, please, um, we'd love to see your um, name and organization in the chat. And if you have any questions, there is a Q&A feature um, where you can enter your questions. If you're interested in getting closed captioning for this event, there's a, a button that you can press along the bottom of the um, Zoom screen that will allow you to see the live captioning. Um, so welcome again, and I'm going to turn it over to Katie Ham, our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development at UCF. Thank you so much, Moshimi. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, as Moshimi said, my name is Katie Ham. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development here at ACF. I'm joining you today from Washington, D.C. in the ancestral home of the Piscataway Anacosta, of Anacostan and the Kachian people. We are so pleased to see the interest in today's conversation. Um, we've had over 575 people registered to attend this webinar. Um, we will be recording so that it will be available for those who are interested but, but not able to join us today, but clearly Many of us are really excited about the opportunity to support and strengthen early childhood programs and systems in Native American communities. We have an unprecedented opportunity today with increased funding through the American Rescue Plan, exciting new proposals to invest more in early childhood, um, as the president has called for in the American Families Plan and the Build Back Better agenda. There's a heightened focus on tribal early childhood issues at the highest levels of government. We are gratified that so many of you are here today to explore the opportunity and kick off a series of meetings to dive deeper into the issues facing early childhood programs in tribal communities. We wanna thank the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco for their partnership in planning these meetings. It's been great to work with you all. Um, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge the horrifying discoveries at the former residential schools. Uh, we mourn the lives lost and the lives impacted. Um, the Biden administration is beginning a federal Indian boarding school initiative to review the impacts of boarding school policies in the U.S. We think it's important to acknowledge this as we talk about early childhood development and the intergenerational impact of these, this trauma. Knowing how critical early childhood programs are to the future of American Indian and Alaska Native communities, we are very excited to be kicking off a new series of meetings on tribal early learning programs and systems. Some of you have noted the use of the term transform in the invitation to today's event. Our intent in using that term was to communicate the idea that we have new opportunities to transform early childhood programs and systems from a siloed and Western worldview to one that is driven by tribal communities' perspectives and goals. and makes coordination and integration of services easier. We know that many tribal communities have already begun that journey. And we hope to use these meetings to lift up the great work that has been happening in communities across the country so that we can all learn from the things that are working and find ways to make it easier to implement approaches that work. In today's webinar, you will hear from ACF leadership about the work that has been happening over the last year to engage tribes on issues of early childhood and the opportunities we see in the current funding and policy environment for Native communities to support and strengthen tribal early childhood systems. We are excited to be able to share this information with a broad audience, with representatives from Head Start, child care, home visiting, and other programs supporting young children and families. It is so important for all of us to hear the same information so we can think about where we might have opportunities to partner at the community level. Then we are excited to welcome a group of tribal early childhood stakeholders for a roundtable discussion 
about what they see as opportunities, challenges, and next steps. Finally, we will close with a preview of the upcoming series of meetings to dive deeper into topics related to implementation and coordination of early childhood programs in Native communities. With that, I am very pleased to introduce you to my colleague from the White House Domestic Policy Council, Libby Washburn, who is the Special Assistant to the President on Native American Affairs. Libby has been a critical partner in our work on Native communities. We are grateful for her willingness to participate in today's webinar um, and grateful to have um, such a wonderful ally in the White House to move this work forward. Libby? Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to join you today. The tribal issues and early childhood issues are critically important to this administration. And I hope that all of you are seeing it in the work and the focus that's going on in, in this meeting today. Definitely, these issues are fundamental to the president's dedication to promoting equity as well. This administration has shown a real commitment to building the nation to nation relationship with tribal governments and advancing the health and well-being of Native people. I want to acknowledge up front the difficulties that everybody has been facing during this pandemic and even before the pandemic. There have been health challenges, mental health challenges, and trauma experienced by children, families, and entire communities. The President's initiatives and his early work, I believe, show a, a strong dedication to promoting nation to nation building. And in doing so, he issued a memorandum on January 26th. And it was a presidential memorandum to strengthen tribal consultation and the nation to nation relationship. And that really kind of set off the, the stage for how we're going to work with tribes going forward in this administration. And I think we're just going to continue to strengthen and show that we really want to make a difference here. And it, it's webinars like this one where, where we can start to, to build and learn and figure out new ways to, to do more in this space. We view this as a kind of a, a beginning point for listening to voices of Native people and communities about what's important to you and how we can support you, your youth, and your families. We know that the children out on the reservations, out in the urban areas, Native um, children are the future, future of the tribal nations, and we're dedicated to helping to support you in strengthening the education system, pre-K, any early childhood programs that we can start to build up in this space. We think that the president's Build Back Better initiative agenda is making a real difference already. And we just see more happening as we start to, to work that Build Back Better plan through Congress. I, I believe in the next few months, we'll be seeing some real lifting up of, of that agenda. Also wanted to start this dialogue today with what we hope will result in stronger tribal early childhood programs and systems. I want to thank you for joining us and for beginning this conversation with us, exploring ways that we can make a real difference. Thank you so much and looking forward to learning from, from this dialogue today. Thanks. Thank you, Libby. My name is Craig Nolte. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and I'm, I'm honored once again to be partnering with ACF and ANA to hold this important workshop. This workshop is important to the Federal Reserve because one of our mandates is full employment, which is challenging without a thriving childcare industry as well as early childhood programs and systems that work well for tribal communities. As you know, the previously known weak weaknesses in the childcare industry have been exacerbated by the pandemic and your childcare programs and your, I mean, your, your early childhood programs and systems have been impacted as well. In the fall of 2020, the San Francisco Fed launched a new initiative called Investing in the Future of Child Care with a series of webinars designed to advance understanding and action in the field. And since that time, we've been working closely with our partners, especially the, for the Administration for Children and Families and ANA to support stakeholders who are committed to boosting the capacity of the child care system 
and identify solutions that benefit both children and working parents. In addition, we're looking at the systems and alignment of other early childhood uh, programs to make sure that they are working well hand in hand with the child care programs too. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle Savoy. Um, Michelle is the acting commissioner with ACF. Michelle? Yawangoa, uh, Craig, Sago, Skanagoagon. Um, thank you uh, for everybody who's provided their opening remarks. Um, it's wonderful to be back uh, with, the, with Craig um, and to be partnering with our new Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood and uh, Libby Washburn from uh, the White House and my other colleagues that you'll hear from later on um, about our, our, our commitment, um, our intent and desire to continue uh, partnering uh, to strengthen and support tribal early childhood. Um, you can go to the next slide. I wanna talk to you about um, uh, some of the work we did uh, based on a congressional request that came in the appropriations language uh, for ANA, um, which is how we became involved in this very uh, important work uh, to support tribal early childhood more uh, deeply and specifically. So um, in our appropriations language, it, there was a request for ACF to stand up a, a tribal early childhood working group. And it specifically requested that we include tribal leaders, tribal early childhood stakeholders, and uh, federal employees who are um, administering these early childhood programs. And we did think about that um, quite broadly. And we obviously started planning this uh, prior to the pandemic. And we imagined a series of regional meetings face-to-face -face that would be day long. Um, however, uh, when we did have to uh, go all virtual, um, we knew that, that, that early childhood is so important to the future of our communities. We didn't not want to go forward despite the great challenges um, that were happening. And we knew uh, that early childhood programs were going to see some of the largest impacts um, from this pandemic. So we did uh, pivot to a virtual format. Um, and in uh, the spring, we sent out a notification to all 574 federally recognized tribes, letting them know that ACF was setting up this tribal early childhood working group. Uh, we uh, posed some questions and encouraged tribes to submit uh, their responses to ACF uh, for consideration uh, by the tribal early childhood work group. Uh, we also um, discussed the Tribal Early Childhood Work Group, the purpose, the goals, and the questions um, at the ACF Annual Tribal Consultation in 2020 and at the HHS Regional Consultations uh, that happened throughout the spring and summer as well. Uh, finally, uh, we were able to send out invitations to that uh, broad group of stakeholders to participate in the working group itself. And from July through September, the working group met uh, to uh, review the different programs across the federal government that support early childhood, to talk about what was happening locally in tribal communities, and to have really um, intentional and intensive dialogues about the coordination challenges um, as well as the successes and what could the federal government do uh, to provide further support. And so there were several key themes and potential actions that came out of that uh, work and the report was released uh, in January. So you can go to the next slide. I wanna talk to you a little, little bit about the stakeholders that were part of the working group um, there were over 50 individuals, including more than 20 representatives from tribes and tribal organizations. Um, some of our ACF tribal advisory committee members uh, participated. And um, as you can see from the slide, there, uh, we had not just ACF early childhood program administrators and leaders participate in those work group sessions, but 
we had partners from um, Indian Health Service, from the Bureau of Indian Education, Department of Education, the USDA. Um, so really a broad represent, representation. And in the last one where we were discussing the themes um, and some of the takeaways, we also invited um, the staff from the members of Congress that oversee ACF so that um, they could see that we had took up their charge to have this working group um, and were uh, thinking very carefully about what we could do. Um, we also invited um, non-federal funders to be part of the working group as well. And finally, we thought a lot about how to involve uh, parents and other caregivers who um, are the direct recipients of these programs in tribal communities. And rather than sort of have them participate in the work group with a lot of, you know, um, discussion about regulations and, and things, we um, had a focus group with them uh, so we could really hear from them, their experience, their, um, uh, what they would wish to see in programming. And we were able to integrate uh, their thoughts and ideas into the conversation as well into the final summary report. I think I have one more slide. So the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is what those themes were. And I'm really glad uh, that um, Katie started out with recognizing uh, the impact of the legacy of boarding schools because our first theme really um, is foundational and that is respecting tribal sovereignty and self-determination. And it's very important that the programs and services um, be tribally driven and have the ability to incorporate language and culture. Uh, there is a continuing need for enhanced trust between tribal nations and federal and state governments and always a need to recognize and respect tribal sovereignty. So that is really a foundational um, part of uh, our theme and our findings and discussion. Um, second, it, we, we understand that there are great challenges around aligning um, programs, of the different uh, eligibility criteria, um, what you can fund and can't fund, uh, resource gaps, streamlining various administrative processes. Um, these often were developed you know, on, you know, in, in different agencies over uh, many years. And so I'm um, continuing to work towards aligning and coordination um, is something that's going to be, that's going to need continuing focus. Uh, we know that there's a need to leverage funding and policy flexibilities um, with all these various funding streams across different federal programs and agencies. Um, it can be difficult and uh, guidance on exercising policy flexibilities and existing funding authority um, is an area where we in the federal government can provide more support. Um, the next theme was around uh, training and technical assistance and coordinating that um, uh, through the conversations of the working group. Uh, there was great affirmation on the importance of cultural and linguistically appropriate training and technical assistance and evidence-based practices to support whole family approaches um, based on very diverse traditions um, in tribal community settings. Uh, there is a strong interest in coordinating and leveraging existing uh, TA, um, and we want to do more uh, to make it easier for uh, those in local communities to access those resources. Um, facilitating collaboration across tribes. Uh, hopefully you're uh, gonna see a little bit of that on the webinar today, uh, because uh, we know that some of the best ideas are gonna be uh, come from your peers and the different tribal innovations uh, that are happening, um, you know, one state over or across the country. And uh, the work group was very clear that there's a desire um, to support that type of partnership and peer sharing um, across tribes. And finally, um, identifying resources for capacity building. Um, and there was a lot, there's obviously many needs, 
um, around workforce and professional development, communications, uh, internet access and facilities infrastructure uh, were great even um, prior to the pandemic. And those needs I think were just heightened um, as a result and um, implementation of culturally informed um, evidence-based practices, um, collaborative research, testing innovations, a lot of um, ability for us to step up um, and provide more resources for capacity building uh, that can be implemented at the local level. So those are the foundational elements that we are um, bringing to the table today uh, to set the stage for our continuing collaboration um, as we go forward um, over the next months and years. Uh, we will continue to value uh, the input of tribal leaders and uh, tribal early childhood administrators um, that are doing this work and overseeing these programs in their local communities. Um, so I would like to turn it back uh, to Kate. Thank you very much, Michelle. I wanted to talk briefly about what the president has proposed to help us build back better when it comes to early childhood. Um, I think we all share um, some awareness of the, the concerns that existed in the early childhood system prior to the pandemic, how the pandemic has made that significantly worse. And some of the ideas to, to build back better with the American Families Plan. So the president has uh, three distinct plans. Um, the American Rescue Plan has passed Congress, is currently being implemented. Um, funds are currently with tribes to um, and with Head Start grantees in tribal communities to help them address some of the needs that have stemmed from the pandemic and the ensuing economic disruption. The American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan um, really provide a vision for what is possible in the long term. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what these plans offer and what they would mean for tribal communities. Next slide. So the American Rescue Plan passed in March. Uh, Dr. Ruth Friedman is here from the Office of Child Care and Dr. Bernadine Fruchel from the Office of Head Start. So they'll talk in a little bit more depth about this. Um, but there is a, there was a $39 billion investment in child care um, in the American Rescue Plan. That was about $720 million for tribes for stabilization. These are grants that go to providers to help them with some of the financial stressors that they are facing. Um, and then there is also uh, $15 billion in supplemental funds, of which about $490 million went to tribal CCDF grantees. This is the largest ever investment in um, childcare for tribes. And Dr. Friedman will talk a little bit about this more in a moment, but it really provides so many opportunities, but also some challenges right now. We really are hoping that those funds can be used to address some of the, the concerns and all of the different challenges that childcare providers have faced during the pandemic. Um, there's a billion dollars in the American Rescue Plan for Head Start. 25 million of that is for American Indian and Alaskan Native grantees. And finally, there's 150 million in, matern in um, tribal home visiting. Um, or sorry, there's 150 million for home visiting, 4.5 million of which went to tribal home visiting grantees. Um, we also wanted to mention the child tax credit expansion, uh, $3,600 available for each child under age six. Um, this is a monthly payment that comes to families as a direct deposit. There's also a link on the IRS website. If you don't, um, if you didn't file taxes in, in 2020 or 2019, you can sign up there. Um, this is really important resources for families, especially um, as many are struggling financially right now. Next slide. So I think we have, um, really we are very fortunate to have resources for the next couple of years to address the the pandemic the financial disruption in the early childhood sector the needs of families and the important role that early childhood programs play in supporting families but what the american families plan offers is beyond those couple of years a long-term vision how do we build back better how do we make sure we have high quality early childhood programs available 
to families um, that they can afford that offer that offer wages. And so this is the plan that will make that vision a reality. There's 225 billion for the Child Care for American Families program. This is a child care entitlement that'll ensure that all families have access to quality, affordable child care if they are low income or moderate income families. There's 200 billion for universal preschool that will be available to all three and four year old children at no cost. And there's 25 billion for child care infrastructure. Um, there was a comment in the chat earlier about wages. Um, and the unfortunate truth is that um, a lot of people who work in early childhood, despite the importance of the work that they do, earn very low wages and, and much lower wages than other comparable industries. So what the president's proposal would do is set a minimum of a $15 an hour wage for everyone who works in childcare, in Head Start, in preschool programs, and ensure that, that that's the floor. For those educators that have degrees that are comparable and qualifications that are comparable to elementary school teachers, they would earn the same wage as, as those um, kindergarten and elementary school teachers. So wages are really at the forefront of the president's plan because that's what's gonna get us to quality. That's gonna make sure we have a really effective staff. Um, and this also um, focuses on mixed delivery. So it acknowledges that, that families are really um, in the best position to decide what kind of setting, whether that's a family childcare, um, if that's a childcare center, if it's a Head Start. Um, so families are really driving the setting that, that works for their family. Next slide. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Ruth Friedman, who is going to talk a little bit more about um, what all of this means for childcare and some of the accomplishments so far in the American Rescue Plan. Dr. Friedman. Thanks, Katie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the opportunities that we have in childcare right now. I think it's a really um, important moment to try to build on all of the challenges that we've had over the past 16 months during this pandemic to see if we can really create a system that will work better for everyone. So just um, for those of you who um, may not be as steeped in um, federal child care policy, we have um, the Child Care Development Fund, uh, which is also referred to as CCDBG. This program supports working families with low incomes by providing access to affordable childcare and after-school programs for children under age 13. There are 265 CCDF tribal lead agencies, which represents over 530 tribes, either directly or through a tribal consortia. And of those 45 have consolidated their childcare program into 477 plans. Next slide. So as Katie mentioned, we have this historic increase in funding for childcare um, right now. And that's what this graph is showing you. Annual appropriations have increased for tribal childcare to over 400 million for tribes in 2021. Um, that's without the COVID funding. With the COVID funding, it's one and a half billion. It's a little over one and a half billion. And what this graph really is representing, I think, is opportunity. This has been a really difficult 16 months um, for families, for children, um, as well as for the child care sector. And unfortunately, it's clear these challenges are not yet over. Um, thankfully, Congress and President Biden have prioritized substantial resources to help families with young children. And child care is just one piece of this. Next slide. So as Katie mentioned, um, we are very focused on wages here in the administration. Um, we think this is the heart of uh, many of the problems we have in the childcare system. There is just inadequate public funding um, for childcare and we see this throughout. We have a system right now that does not meet, meet the needs of children and families it serves. It fails the child care providers themselves who exist on razor thin profit margins. 
and staff are deeply underpaid for the essential work that they are doing. And this is a system that we think must be changed. Next slide. So our aim in thinking through the ARP money, which is the money that Katie referenced, has already passed Congress, it's already um, been uh, distributed to tribes, is to build stronger tribal early childhood programs and systems. So we are hoping these uh, funds are going to be used to increase rages, wait, excuse me, rates and wages for child care providers to support children's development through equal access to high quality childcare programs so that every family who is participating in the program really has access to the type and the kind of childcare that they want. It should be used to help more families afford childcare. And we wanna make sure that the funds are being used to, with an equitable distribution to support historically underserved communities. Next slide. So to dig in a little bit deeper, right now there are four pots of COVID-related funding. The first pot is the CARES pot, which is, was $95 million went to tribes in March 2020, with 15 months left to obligate these funds and a little bit over two more years to spend these funds. We also have what we refer to as the CURSA funds. This was $275 million that went to tribes in December of 2020. And we now have, we're at a point where tribes have a little over 15 months to obligate these funds and a little over two years to spend them down. And then the most recent um, pot of money came in March of this year. And this was actually two distinct programs within the American Rescue Plan. The first is a stabilization program, which I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, but it is a brand new program. And it's $719 million were allocated to tribes in March, uh, excuse me, in April, the money actually went. Um, uh, there are a couple key dates here to know. Um, first, tribes need to let ACF know if they are going to be unable to obligate at least 50% of the funds by the end of this year. If that's the case, um, we have um, a number of systems in place to help any lead agency who is facing challenges with obligating the funds. We wanna make sure um, that you guys are able to spend uh, this money the way you would like to spend it to build a better system. Tribes have a little bit over 15 months to obligate the rest of this money and a little over two years to spend it. And then the fourth pot is the supplemental funding, which is really um, very closely aligned to the current Child Care Subsidy Program. And this included $449 million um, for tribes that were allocated in April of this year. And again, there are a couple of key dates to be aware of here. First, if um, tribes have to notify ACF by April of 2023, if any funds can't be obligated by the end of, 2020, of September, 2023. Um, if that's the case, the funds will be reallotted to other tribes. So April 1st is actually the first key date. Uh, but tribes actually have until September 2023 to obligate all of the funds, and they have a little over three years from today to spend all of the funds. Next slide. Um, so I want to provide just a little bit more detail on each of the two programs that was included in the American Rescue Plan. The first is a stabilization program, which is a new program, and it's meant to support the entire child care market. So that means it's um, eligible for providers regardless of whether or not they have participated um, in child care subsidy programs currently or in the past. Uh, the aim of these programs is to drive funding to child care providers to help stabilize them, make them whole from all of um, the losses and in income and challenges they've had during the pandemic. So this funding is not directly for child care assistance to families. It is really aimed at supporting child care providers. It is important to note that tribes are, used, are able to use this funding for construction or major renovation after ACF approval. And as I already mentioned, tribes have a little over two more years to spend it. And then the second pot of money is the supplemental funds. And this really, for those of you familiar with the child care subsidy system, 
is very closely aligned to it. Uh, it provides a little bit more flexibility on how tribes can, how much tribes can spend on direct services or quality activities. Um, but the main purpose here is to use it to increase the quality and the supply of child care providers serving eligible children and to help more parents afford child care and access to subsidies. It's really important to note that um, funds in each of these programs can be used by tribes to hire staff to administer these programs. Um, this is um, a lot of uh, infrastructure that needs to be built, a lot of expansion of the program, I think, that we're seeing with these increases of the funds. And I think it is gonna be really hard for most lead agencies to do that with um, the staff that they had on board to um, administer a much smaller program. So we are strongly encouraging lead agencies to use these funds uh, to hire um, administrative staff so that we can have strong program administration. Next slide. Um, and here we just have a few more details on the stabilization funds. Uh, it's just important to note again, um, the goal here is to support the broader childcare sector both during and after the pandemic. At least 80% of these funds must be used for subgrants to eligible and qualified child care providers, but it is the tribal lead agencies who design the grants, the subgrants themselves. We have strongly encouraged lead agencies to include centers, family child care, and school age programs in their subgrant programs so that families are able to make, uh, get their needs met and so that the entire sector is lifted up after the typical pandemic. Next slide. So much more detail is available on um, the Office of Child Care's website, but this gives you um, an overview of the different types of expenses that are allowed uh, through the subgrants. Again, the tribal lead agencies design their own program, uh, but it is based on this allowable use of funds. So it's really broad. You'll see here that all personnel costs including uh, benefits, premium pay, recruitment and retention, wages, all of that can be covered under subgrants. Uh, and the aim of this is to make sure uh, that programs can be more stable moving forward. But it is also important to note that childcare providers may use the subgrants to reimburse themselves for allowable expenses uh, that they may have incurred during the pandemic but prior to this money becoming available in March. Next slide. So I said 80% needs to go to subgrants, up to 20% can go to administration, supply building and technical assistance. We think this is really crucial to um, helping uh, deal with supply challenges as well as implementing a strong program. So again, here, as I noted, uh, there's quite a lot of money available for states to hire, uh, excuse me, for tribes to hire more staff um, to help with program administration. Next slide. And then a couple uh, quick notes here. So tribally operated centers are eligible to receive stabilization funds from the tribal lead agency, but they're also uh, eligible to receive uh, subgrant funds from the state at the state discretion. Uh, so they can be getting support from both um, uh, programs. Um, it is also important to note, however, um, that stabilization funds um, uh, must be used to supplement and not supplant tribally, tribally operated funds. Um, and finally, uh, we know there are a lot of tribal Head Start programs that may also be um, using child care services to extend their day or offer additional services to families, additional hours or additional days. Um, it is possible for Head Start grantees to receive uh, child care stabilization grants as well, in addition to the Head Start COVID funds. We just ask uh, that this be done um, uh, carefully to make sure there's enough funds for childcare programs who are not Head Start grantees. 
Uh, next slide. I need to wrap up quickly here, but as I mentioned earlier, it is important to note again that tribal lead agencies do have the flexibility of using their entire ARP Act uh, for funds on construction and major renovation. We know this is a large need in some communities, and so this is a really uh, incredible opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, final slide. Uh, and then with that, again, just to uh, point out again, the second program that passed this spring uh, acts very much like the existing child care um, pro subsidy program, but we hope that tribes use this opportunity to increase provider payment rates, improve payment policies, uh, doing things like paying on uh, enrollment instead of attendance, and increasing, making sure that there are increases in wages for child care staff and, file, and family child care providers. We think that if the money is not spent on this, um, we won't get to the system that we all want for kids and families. And so with that, I think I'm gonna conclude and hand it over to Dr. Bernadine Futrell, who is the director of the Office of Head Start. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedman, um, and, and good afternoon, everyone. As, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Futrell, Director of the Office of Head Start. I'd like to first start um, first by acknowledging um, that the recent findings um, at the residential schools are a painful reminder to tribal communities and the rest of the nation of, our, of a dark period in our history. And, also want to acknowledge that it's especially difficult to discuss and address as the premise was kind of cloaked in education. And so as we come together today to talk about moving forward, um, I also want to pause and say thank you to the Head Start community, to our leaders, to our workforce. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you. I know um, when the pandemic was closing things down, Head Start programs, remained open, continued to serve, continued to partner with families, changed models to really get out and do the great work of Head Start. And I thank you for that. Um, as mentioned, I'm the director of the Office of Head Start, but most importantly, I wanna share that I am also a Head Start baby, a Head Start child. And it is my commitment um, in, this, in this position to really move towards equity um, as an outcome for the work of the Office of Head Start in concert with President Biden and the entire administration. And so when I say equity, I wanna be clear what I mean. We're looking for addressing and disrupting inequities. In my heart of hearts, I know this happens with one conversation at a time. And I'm grateful and thankful because I know today's conversation is one of many that will get us there. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, the ARP funds within Head Start. Um, around some of the things we put in place to make it available and flexible so that it meets the needs at the local level in communities. Um, and before I um, go to the update, I do want to pause and recognize and say thank you to all of the panel that's going to come after me, as well as everyone involved in this webinar and the hundreds of you that are on the line um, to really say thank you for amplifying and supporting um, the president and our commitment to making this work a priority, knowing that we can do more together um, than we could do on, a, on our own. So I'm thankful for you and thankful for that. So to get started with the American Rescue Plan for uh, the Head Start programs, as um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary Ham mentioned, the ARP funding did provide $1 billion for the Head Start program. All of the funds went out by formula. So it was based on funded enrollment. And so what that meant for um, the Tribal Head Start and Early Head Start programs is roughly about 25 million. That e equates to about 1,100 per child enrolled in a Head Start program. Most of this funding was already issued in early July with some um, programs are still kind of receiving the funds. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. The, the ARP, again, as similar to um, Dr. Friedman's remarks, it was issued in separate funding. So we have the um, 
grants from the um, CURSA funds, and then we also had the ARP funds that came um, in March. And so those two combined um, are what we are putting under the umbrella of ARP funding. So we want to lift up that programs have two years to utilize this funding. It was issued as a supplement to the initial grant um, uh, in January. So the funds that are not used this year can be carried over to the following fiscal year. However, you should work with your regional program manager, so Region 11 team, Todd um, and others, to really put in the request to put to have your uh, carryovers um, approved and put in place. Because the idea with all of this funding, just to be very clear and plain, is to um, empower and support the local community to make the best decisions about what it means to build back out of the pandemic. So the ARP funding is designed to be flexible and, and meet the needs in your local conditions because we know there is wide um, uh, differences and experiences of what it's gonna take to get back to in-person service, get back to enrollment and all those other measures that we put out there. So we really want to encourage you and remind you to, to think about it in that sense. And if you have any questions, work with the Region 11 team for the Office of Head Start for um, any, any additional help with that. Next slide, please. Thank you. I also think it's important if you want to um, kind of refer back to um, you know, something <laughs> that we've issued around what the use of the funds could be. The Office of Head Start on, on May 4th issued um, funding um, kind of guidance in terms of first to say the ARP funds are coming, here's what you can expect, but also we called out kind of three areas that we think the priority could be at the local um, level around the ARP funds. Facilities, staffing, as well as um, enrollment and recruitment. So this um, I am provides some additional information on that. And that was again, April 4, I mean, excuse me, May 4th, but it's also available on our website. But I do want to lift up, um, I know we're talking about wages and we're doing the best that we can um, as an administration, but I also wanna lift up that one of the flexibilities or the opportunities similar to Dr. Freeman's remarks is to address um, the workforce with the ARP funds. And so um, I don't know if you can see the whole um, PI here, but please download it, um, print it out and use that to help guide some of the planning with the use of the funds. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide is a brain that highlights all of the expected uses of the Head Start ARP fund. So we took the PI and we put it on this graphic here. And so um, what you'll see are just some recommended ways that programs are using the ARP funds. If you can see the difference in color, where you see green, those are the top three things that we are hearing from Region 11, our tribal programs, in terms of what um, the use of the funds are. So facility improvements, enrollment activities, staff and consultants. So for the staff piece, things like fringe benefits, things like one-time um, incentives or, or hiring additional people. The one thing to be you know, very clear about this funding is while it is one-time only funding, we're really encouraging and hoping that the things we that we use it for have long-term sustainable impact. And so that's why we have this brain here with these um, examples, but it's not, this doesn't limit it. it it's open. We, we are, we're saying what's happening at the local level should drive your decisions. And some of those decisions, and you can see another trend is around the vaccine support. So it depends on what's happening in the local areas that um, will get you towards getting back to in-person services. Next slide, please. Thank you. And I want to just lift up our website. We update this often. Um, it's the uh, COVID-19 and the Head Start community website where we provide information on our webinars. And you can also go and see stories about how other programs are using the funds. And I know we show the brain and we have some examples in the PI, but there might be other examples that people are using that you could adapt and apply to, to your program. So I wanna just lift that up as well. Um, all of this again is designed to really lean into um, how, how we can support and partner with the local community in leading the way to what it, what it will take to get back to in-person and really to build out and back out of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you. I do want to highlight and lift up uh, next week um, is our fourth 
series in our Head Start Forward webinar series, and it's going to be on health and safety considerations. And I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with, but the Head Start Forward series is a series we launched the day after Head Start's birthday to really come together as a Head Start community to talk about what it takes to get back to in-person services. So we know that in March 2020, we didn't have a choice to make a lot of plans and to prepare. And so what we're saying now is we're in this ramp up period towards getting back and we're watching the local conditions and we're looking to see what happens, but we're starting now by laying the groundwork and creating our plans to get there. And so the Head Start for a webinar series does that and as a community. And so you can go back and look at some of the previous ones we've done. We, we, we had two actually follow up around enrollment and program structure, recently had one on mental health, staff wellness, and we're gonna have one on health and safety considerations. And then the last one, August 25th, will be showcasing kind of what we're learning from our programs across the nation. What I will say is the, the structure of the Head Start for webinars, they are webinars where we're giving new content and then we're also going through a Q&A process answering questions that we picked up from the previous webinar. So they're always kind of connected as a thread. So, if, um, you, and you can look at the uh, recordings. You can also submit questions so that we can make sure we are addressing them. If you have um, questions that you're not seeing answered, please submit them and be a part of our Head Start Forward series because together we're going to kind of create our plan to move forward. Next slide, please. And I would be remiss if I did not um, kind of pause and, and encourage and, and recognize um, just uh, the, the, the need and the opportunity to, to get vaccinated if you're not. Um, on March 1st, we were very pleased that the president prioritized the Head Start community, the child care community um, for vaccination access. And so we want to kind of encourage, um, you know, Head Start programs as leaders and communities to kind of really work together with um, the pharmacies and with others in the community to make vaccine available. There's also some flexibilities within the ARP funding to really support staff and employees as they get vaccinated as well. Things like time off or things like, um, you know, kind of creating conditions where it's easier to get the vaccine um, because together we can, we can do this, but there's also um, and an acknowledgement and recognition that the pandemic and, and COVID is still here. So we can do our part and um, as leaders, especially with an um, head start to really move forward towards um, getting, getting families vaccinated and getting, getting our, our workforce vaccinated. And my final slide um, is just a reminder that we're, we're going to do this together. We are at a significant point in our nation, in our history, and we have an opportunity to really come together and the beautiful um, experiences that we all bring to the table will really help us move back and build back stronger. So I want, again, I wanna thank you all for your work, your commitment um, and for passing the message on that um, it is important. It's important that we do it together and it's important that we come back stronger. And with that, I wanna say thank you and I'll turn it back to Katie Ham. And I um, am really pleased to have the opportunity to um, introduce our panel. So I will turn it over um, to Greg Matson, who's going to lead our um, panelists today in a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I agree to everyone out there in virtual land. Uh, she mentioned my name is Greg Mastin. I'm a member of the Yurok tribe. I'm also a descendant of the Hoopa and the Karuk people, and I just greet you all in, in a good way. And I'm um, honored to be here with an amazing panelist group. Um, they've got some great insights to share with you all, and it's a, it's a diverse group. Um, I'd like to give them the opportunity to um, introduce themselves. And, um, but before I do that, I guess I should finish. Um, so I'm uh, with the Native Americans and Philanthropy Organization. I'm their vice uh, president of Tribal Nations Engagement and Special Projects. And uh, we have about 25 minutes. So if each of the panelists can briefly introduce themselves and we'll start with uh, Vice Chair Fouget and then Jackie, Jennifer, Nicole, and Dr. Lindquist. Vice Chair. Uh, 
can they they're mute you have to unmute. now i can yeah. hello my name is lorraine gouge and i'm the lacuterie i'm the vice chairwoman of the lacuterie band of lake superior triple indians located in hayward wisconsin and um, i'm here today to join the panel as we discuss one of the most critical areas that we have within all our tribes um, taking care of our children and educating them and um, I feel very honored to be a part of this panel and um, I've heard a lot of good things today and we continue to share and encourage what we can across the nation with throughout Indian country and um, we want to be able to build on what we have and, and to provide and care for as many of our people as we can I appreciate all the good words that have been shared so far all the people that have brought things to the table um, I, we value that and we want to continue to work on our um, relationships and our partnerships and um, the respect that's given government to government. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I was excited about joining today. So miigwech. Thank you, Jackie. And I'm Jackie Haight. I work with the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe in Washington state. I'm the director of Head Start Early Head Start and Extended Day Child Care. I'm also a um, one of the National Indian Head Start Director Association past leaderships and advocates. And uh, that association along with NICA are two of our national organizations that at the core support our children and families across the country. And I'm so glad to have a tribal leader on the panel with us um, as we move forward in this conversation about the opportunities. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Ratcliffe. I am the Executive Director of the National Indian Child Care Association. Um, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and am currently sitting on the current territory space of the Cherokee Nation and the historic lands of the Osage Nation. Thank you for having me here and I'm really excited to be talking about this and, and looking at how we can really transform child care in tribal communities. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, my name is Nicole. I am from the tribe San Felipe. Um, I'm part of the National Home Visitor Program. I'm actually more of a parent, more on that part because of my experience. And I am a mother to five children, uh, ages from three to 15 now. Um, yeah, this is great, a great thing to be a part of. I'm thankful to be a part of it, thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Lindquist. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for having me as part of this um, interesting and honorable panel along with this whole webinar. I'm, I'm very appreciative to um, ACF, Administration for Children and Families, for inviting me and for having this webinar for tribal people, tribal leaders. I'm Cynthia Lindquist, or my Dakota name is Starhorse Woman. I'm a member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation in Fort Totten, North Dakota. I am president of a tribal college. I also happen to administer our tribe, my tribe's Head Start program. And I believe that's part of why I've been invited to be here. But I am a grandma, I am a mother. <laughs> This stuff affects us in so many ways and um, I'm really excited to be part of this. So let's get going. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lindquist. Um, so yeah, we have a, um, it is a roundtable format. And just for the audience out there, we have uh, four to six questions we hope to get through depending on our time. And uh, what I'll do is I'll ask um, one or two of the panelists to respond to each question. So I believe you all have the questions there. So we'll just jump right into it. Uh, the first question will be for Vice Chair Gouget and Jennifer Ratcliffe. Um, first question is a two-parter. Based on your role, what do you see as the greatest opportunity for building stronger early childhood programs and systems in the current environment? And how do you see the American Rescue Plan funds contributing to this? We'll start with uh, Vice Chair Gouget. You know, I did not see the questions beforehand, but I'm gonna answer that. Um, we are, within our tribe, we were in the process of um, addressing what we were seeing in our community. We, we did not have a childcare uh, facility. 
so we built the uh, facility with the monies that were handed down to us to meet the need of our members who are working and those who are going to school and the needs of our family, families. So we, we uh, pursued that, a daycare center. So we built a daycare center for our people. We do have an existing early childhood and childhood program. Again, very needed within our community. Um, we are educating and preparing our children for that kindergarten readiness, but we have a lot of poverty in our area also. And we wanna provide that care that is needed um, to those children and to the best that we can and to um, help those families. And during this pandemic, um, we had faced many hardships and um, how it affected all our people at all levels um, um, was very intense. And, um, and you touched on some of this in some of the, the speakers before when it came to mental health, it came to um, food, you know, the families needed food, they needed care, they needed um, all the resources they could get to get through this pandemic. You're talking about isolation, you're talking about those who did not have the resources they needed um, to get through this and, and we tried to do everything we could to help them. So we um, appreciate all the monies that are coming forward now. In fact, I just met with some of our uh, programmers this morning and um, how this will help us. Now, now we have to build now. You get a facility in place, you get your staff in place, now we got to keep moving forward so that we can um, um, pay these teachers and individuals that are providing that care. And then with our doors opening back up now to all the students, um, um, it's important that we, we keep building what we have. And the other thing is not only just within our tribe, we are also helping other tribes, other bands of Ojibwe people trying to get things established. We are sharing with them what we are learning. So I think um, one of the messages here that I'm hearing is that we need to continue to um, build on that so that our people can have the resources they need and are able to build on what they have and to help provide what our people need across the board. So um, uh, I, I wanted to express that because of the, especially during this pandemic that we all experienced and we live in a remote area. We do, um, we are not in a, um, we're in a rural area and um, some of our villages are all broken up and our, our land is kind of checkerboard. And so some of our people are all over. So whenever we can help to, to provide what we can for our families and our children, um, it's very important on how we can do that. And um, so I'm really appreciative of the funding that's coming through to help and assist that because now we're building. And um, I think that's exactly what you are addressing here. And that's what President Biden's administration is um, really um, supporting and um, what he's trying to do to, to help our people. And, um, and so I wanna keep um, that communication there and, and ways that we can um, um, apply for these grants and the things that are needed and can keep encouraging others. Like I said, with the other bands of Ojibwe people, we are gonna help them any way we can and then keep guiding them along because they need those services in, in their communities also. So um, I, I don't wanna take up too much time, but that's just um, my response. That I did not see the questions prior, I'm sorry, but um, I'm glad I was able to respond to that one. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts, uh, Jennifer. Um, I want to acknowledge the vice chairwoman's words because it's really hard to talk about opportunity after we're coming from such a place during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but we are finding ourselves in this amazing uh, space of opportunity. And I think the one, the couple of things that I want to highlight in response to this is the, the opportunity we have to build integrated and holistic systems with these resources that have, that have been handed down to us. And I appreciate um, that there are communities, as we just heard, that are really looking at how they strategically um, make impacts in their communities across the sector, across the system, and not just in one area. And both Dr. Friedman and Dr. Futrell talked about this: of how do we bridge these gaps of the of the entire across the entire system in in childcare and Head Start, in home visiting, even in child welfare, and making sure that we're incorporating our language and culture into all of these areas, and really bridging the gaps within our own communities and as well across the community even more broadly. Um, so I want to also 
we just, I want to say that tribes have a really unique opportunity right now to be a shining example of exactly what comprehensive high quality early childhood services can look like. And we have to take this opportunity because we're, we're communities that can focus holistically on this. We have to take that opportunity. And there are examples of programs that are um, having great success with this, braiding their funding together, using cost allocations, looking at funding streams from not just the federal government, but revenues and foundation and grants and tribal funding. And they're putting that all together into a seamless system where families don't don't even know who's participating in what service. And this is just the opportunity we have to create this holistic system and tribes stand at a really fantastic space for doing that and being the example for the nation of what early childhood can look like. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for sharing that with us. The, uh, the next question is for uh, Dr. Lindquist and Jackie Haidt. Um, from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges around implementing and coordinating early childhood services in tribal communities and why? So we'll start with Dr. Lindquist. Thank you. And um, I volunteered when we did a pre thing yesterday for this question. And now I'm like, oh, I'd rather talk about the good things than what we can do. Um, and the challenges for me are very personal because again, I do run my Tribes Head Start program, which is functioning right now, but I'm struggling to keep it open because I don't have enough trained staff, trained tribal members to staff the program. We're very small, we're serving about 150, 155 children. I have a brand new facility that has 19 classrooms. We're only operating 11 classrooms because I do not have enough trained tribal members to staff the program. And then the other issue that ties into it is childcare. So it's extended care hours, not only for the employees who staff the program, but for the parents who come and use the program and that they, they need more of that wraparound services. So the challenges is having depth of infrastructure and, and implementing a depth of infrastructure to run and operate these programs. And as much as there's some opportunities right now, I'm, I'm like, can you give me a team of tribal people from I don't care where who can come to Fort Taunton, North Dakota to help staff my program to amp it up at the same time providing training. The other thing which is more philosophical as far as challenges for what we're trying to do, and I don't think this is just Indian country, I think that the issue is going on across this country, but it's workforce and workforce readiness related to ethics, related to professionalism, time and attendance, and how do we teach people simple basic things about respectful behavior when you're an employee. Then you tie in the cultural competency that has to come along with that in Indian country. These things are all tied together. And yes, we have wonderful models and I do have great, great people, but unfortunately I keep putting more work on those same people. Could you do this? Could you take on that? And I've told my staff, I'm gonna quit doing that. I'm gonna quit doing that, but, but we're so desperate for need. The other thing that's critical relative to the moment in time, pandemic has, you know, most of us are rural, reservation based. Okay, it's expensive. It's been expensive all the time. Pandemic has put a whole nother layer relative to expense, cost, and getting things to Fort Taunton, North Dakota. Um, and I don't know how we're going to continue to pay for these things, the uh, basic things, basic supplies, food pens and paper, et cetera, and that. So these things are all intricately linked. So if the federal government and those who are in positions of power understand this to help open those doors, give us the flexibility, give me the flexibility as I operate my program, as I operate and try to do better training to do what I think I can do to the best of my ability, I'll still be accountable. And I believe that's what this is all about today. So I, I'm very hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindquist. And uh, Jackie, the same question, what do you see are the biggest challenges around implementing and coordinating the early childhood services in tribal communities? Okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Lindquist, for your words. And I speak on behalf of my grandson who is a Port Gamble Scalala member who I hope one day will be a leader 
and all of these stories will be told um, in the canoes as they journey together, as they join together, which they desperately need to do now around the canoe. Um, and I was so pleased to listen to um, our White House uh, Special Assistant Libby uh, Washburn earlier in our presentation, uh, because I think what is key to the challenges we face is the understanding of sovereignty and the understanding that the, this should be the opportunity for tribes to be able to truly self-govern their early childhood programs. And to truly, as uh, uh, Ms. Lindquist talked about, um, have the flexibilities to uh, partner, coordinate, align within their community itself and within their counties and state structures to create that program for their children and families. Um, I really agree with the former speakers talking about we can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. um, but tribes need to come together to do this. They need to get, come together as, uh, in my state, there are 29 recognized tribes in many other tribal communities. Of those 29, my Lummi friends need to do that together. They need to do it together with the flexibility within their community to know what their um, uh, challenges are and to move forward to the solutions that the elders perhaps have given them stories about what it was like before. I think primarily uh, some of the challenges within each of the tribes are in different states. And I think we're very fortunate in Washington that we have 29 states. Um, I cannot say enough about coordinating and aligning with my peers to really talk through what our individual challenges are as because it brings us together around solutions for our own communities. Um, working with states, I think is critical. And I know that each tribe has their own relationship and challenge within that structure. And I'm not saying that I expect the federal government to uh, be finding the solutions for us, but there needs to be some really uh, clear uh, guidance to states because our citizens are nations within our nations and nations of the larger nation. So the opportunities are even greater for our families and children as they should be based on our individual treaties. Um, the other area that I'm really um, speaking specifically for Port Gamble, and I know a lot of our other friends in Washington state and across the country, as we do face uh, the, the quality, uh, the big quality, uh, <laughs> uh, it's always hiding behind the door of uh, equitable wages for our staff. Some tribes have moved forward to, um, you know, very thoughtfully analyze their wages and comparabilities and raise those wages up. As we do that, as we have done that through 2018, 2019 and into the pandemic, we find that our own staff who we've raised them up into that 20 above $20 an hour wage, we still have a ways to go to get equity for our, our K-12 teachers. So this is really a profession it's not a service, it's a big service, but it's a profession um, within zero to five services. But eligibility and enrollment then becomes an issue when you're not even serving your own children and families of your tribe or of your immediate community. So eligibility and enrollment is, a, 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 I hope there's a solution with this, uh, these ARPA funds and the ability for us to, um, create our own path. And the last thing I'll talk about is the opportunity to look at your curriculums within your early childhood programs and look at incredible systems that you can create uh, assessment systems for your children that are based on your cultural curriculum and know that uh, in our state of Washington, a few of our tribes have looked at outdoor preschool 
and really uh, looking at indigenous learning systems and where is the best place for our children. Um, and that's an opportunity within these funds too, uh, to really look at some, I know, I, I'm sure from Dr. Lindquist's perspective of working in higher ed, that there are so many of the tribal um, uh, young people who are interested in this area and uh, creating writing curriculums that look at the integration of our specific uh, culture, language, song, and dance. Um, and that is something we can celebrate for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. So we have time for one last question. We've got about uh, three or four minutes. Um, and this is for Nicole. Uh, so Nicole, as a parent receiving early childhood services, what messages uh, do you have for policymakers, funders, and program administrators about how to better meet the needs of Native families? Um, since I'm receiving a home visitor program, it's been really great, especially when I was experiencing postpartum depression. Um, I felt very isolated, um, and my home visitor gave me great comfort that I didn't feel so isolated, especially or feel so judged. Um, when I was younger, when I first had my baby, I was 17. Um, I had some help with childcare, but then when I got married, cause I was still finishing high school. When I got married, then they took that back because I got married. And then after me and my ex-husband divorced, then, you know, I got help for childcare again, but we weren't making, yeah, I wasn't making a lot of money. And then when I got remarried again, um, you know, then they're like, oh, we can't help you anymore because you got married. Um, I was told that I shouldn't be based off my marital status, you know, um, and especially since I have five children now, um, we get very limited to certain things that we can get help for. So I would, my part would be like, well, shouldn't be based off my marital status um, to get help for childcare especially since I was pursuing school, um, I had to stop going to school because I couldn't get childcare anymore. Um, I had to do online, which was very, and it's still very limited even more during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, that's probably another big thing for me that shouldn't be such a big issue on applying for childcare, especially since I wanna uh, make my financial situation for my family better, you know? Um, I, very limited when, I, when I'm stuck like that. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we have just a couple of extra minutes. Do any of the panelists want to respond um, to Nicole's input? Um, I'd like to say thank you for hanging in there and for keep trying. I hope you're pursuing college. There's a lot of opportunities through the tribal college systems in that most of us are still doing hybrid in that. And, and you have a great point about access and then how that access happens. And yeah, why should you be cut off because you got married? You know, how do we continue to, to keep all those services holistic for your benefit as an individual, but then as a mother and as a spouse, as a parent and trying to build that family unit and, and we need to do a better job. The other thing I'd like to just mention as part of this, as, as far as next steps is communication. Mm -hmm. You know, that we need to do better at communicating with each other. Um, I'm surprised at what I've learned already on this webinar. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm pretty smart and I'm pretty sophisticated, but part of my issue for me is that I'm overwhelmed and I don't have enough staff. I don't have a grant writer. I don't have a development office, you know, and I, I kind of know what my tribe's doing, but not really. And as much as social media and online is the presence right now, don't forget about radio. Don't forget about print. <laughs> At least here in my community, my elders still greatly appreciate when the meals go out every day that they, they see a piece of paper with, with announcements and the notices and that. And so as much as online and, and distance ed and all of this and that, the old ways sometimes are still good and still viable ways. And we, we need to improve how we communicate. And so we know more. Uh, one minute. 
I'd like to I'd like to actually reflect on Dr. Linquist's point as points as well because I just want to share the kind of thing that keeps me up at night is that we have this opportunity in front of us and the biggest challenge I see is that we didn't have the infrastructure beforehand and now we're expected to do all of these things and and create all of these new opportunities and build these greater systems without an infrastructure that we did that from before and so my biggest concern is we aren't going to be able to even create the infrastructure we need to get it going before the time runs out to use these this funding so we like dr linquist said and, and everybody on the panel and even in the federal offices we have to communicate, we have to support one another, we have to push each other because this is a rapid fire movement to transform, the, uh, to take on this opportunity of transforming early care and education. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. And I think we're about out of time now. So I wanna thank all the panelists for their time and their input and thank everyone that's been listening. And thank you also for the good work that you do out there of uh, supporting our children. I had an elder share with me. He said, that is our greatest resource, our children. So thank you all for the wonderful work you do out there. And I'll turn it back to. Thank you. Um, I do think we have a couple extra minutes if Vice Chairman Ipuche wants to speak. I think you were, you were trying to speak just now. So I wanna make sure you get a chance to make your point. Yes, I'd like to acknowledge Nicole's story she shared with us. That's the reality of what we are seeing our people and it's important that we support them and, and encourage them and provide the care that the little ones need and um, not make it harder for them to be able to have that support but to have help them in ways that we can and I know within um, the programming too we also see within any country there are those who are doing better and who are doing things and then they don't qualify they don't qualify for certain help and support so we want to keep building on what we can and we want to keep encouraging our people to get educated and to work and do those things but to go to continue to grow in that way also is important because then we're reaching more and um, um we want them to be successful we want them to be happy we want them to have things in life we, nicole I, I again want to thank you for sharing that and those are the the realities of where we are at and um it is important for you and your family um to, to have the, everything you can to, to be successful. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Boucher. And thank you to the whole panel and to Greg. Um, we really so appreciate your input and your thoughts and your experiences and wish only wish we had more time to hear from all of you. Um, sorry, we only were able to get to a few questions, but this will not be the end. And that's what I wanted to uh, talk to you all about now. So this is actually um, the first meeting in a series of meetings related to implementation, coordination, and alignment of tribal early childhood programs. So this isn't the first time that um, you all will have an opportunity to hear directly from tribal communities. The goal of this series that we're gonna have is to lift up the key issues that tribal communities and early childhood programs are dealing with and share examples, innovation, and resources so that additional communities can benefit from what other native, native communities are doing. And as our speakers just talked about, you know, the opportunity for tribes to hear from each other and really there's so much amazing work happening throughout Indian country in both um, rural and reservation and urban settings. and um, we're just really excited to have this opportunity over the next several months to have some more meetings to talk about various issues. So we're going to be looking at a number of topics related to implementation and coordination of early childhood programs and systems. So including um, ensuring equity, so understanding the need for services and building the supply, um, building and improving facilities for early care and education, which uh, Vice Chairman Gouge spoke to. Uh, professional development opportunities and challenges, family engagement and family leadership, because we know that families are the most important part of what we're doing and we wanna hear from them about what's really the most important to them and give them chances to, to thrive and be leaders in their communities. Supporting coordinated data systems, um, blending and braiding 
funding and policy flexibilities. And we're going to be having um, meetings approximately monthly through the end of the year. And then we'll have a final meeting to discuss findings, conclusions, and next steps. And depending on the timing, this meeting could be in person. I guess we'll see what happens with the pandemic. Um, we're aiming for early 2022 for that. The first meeting of the series, we're looking at doing on August 23rd from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be covering two topics that we think are really critical to tribal early childhood programs. One, around integrating language and culture into programming, and two, addressing mental and behavioral health challenges of young children and families. Um, and we're just very excited to um, have the opportunity to uh, you know, have this series and share what's happening in the tribal communities across the country. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to join those meetings and look forward to um, connecting with many of you. Now I will turn it over to Katie to close us out. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists and our facilitator, Greg, for, for joining us and sharing their, their thoughts, their expertise um, and their wisdom with us. Um, this has been so, so informative um, for me and I know for, for many of the folks listening today. Um, we are really looking forward to continuing the conversation um, from hearing from everyone, from learning more. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for your time because I know that that is a, a precious resource. Um, so thank you, um, have a great weekend, and we look forward to connecting with you on these important topics going forward. <laughs>